Greetings, Emmett here from Reading for Wisdom. Today we have a little sojourn into the past. Uh, we're going to go back to 1337 to be precise, uh, to the beginning of what became the Hundred Years' War. Now, it actually didn't last 100 years, uh, about 116 years. And was it one single war? Uh, no, really a series of um, battles and conflicts between the crown in England and the crown in France, all over the inheritance of the French kingdom. Uh, a really, really complex and a messy and fascinating uh, story um, that's uh, been compared to the real Game of Thrones. I, I think that's certainly where George Martin got a lot of his inspiration from, the Hundred Years' War. And it is a fascinating period in history. We have so many great characters. Henry V, uh, right at the far end of the uh, Hundred Years' War. Uh, Edward III, uh, right at the beginning. And figures like the Black Prince, Joan of Arc, of course, and some names that forever live strong in uh, military history. Certainly, if you're English, Cressy, Poitiers, and of course, Agincourt. Agincourt made so famous through one of the greatest works of literature of all time, Henry V by William Shakespeare. So, who's going to give us our little guided tour of the Hundred Years' War? Gordon Corrigan in this cracker of a book. Uh, this is a great and glorious adventure, a military history of the Hundred Years' War. Now, uh, when I came across this book, um, first of all, when I saw the title, A Military History of the Hundred Years' War, to be honest with you, I was a little bit wary. Because some military history, let's face it folks, can be a bit dry, particularly with its focus on the minutiae of battle, uh, often to the detriment of the wider, bigger picture, uh, logistics, um, sort of the real genuine foundation of a tactical basis, people. Uh, the people of the countryside, the people who, ordinary people who had to live through wars um, in the past. But when I saw that this book was by Corrigan, I went, right, I'm going to buy that. Why? Corrigan is a fabulous writer. I'm a big fan. He is uh, a former uh, major. Um, uh, Apologies, uh, Mr. Corrigan, if I um, uh, disinflated your uh, ranking. Um, but he served for many, many years uh, with the Gurkhas. Um, so a fine soldier with an impeccable history. Has an MBE and a whole host of really, really interesting books to his name. First time I came across Corrigan was through a book of his called Mud, Blood and Poppycock, which was puncturing some of the myths about the First World War, uh, puncturing the myths of armchair historians who probably couldn't really quite grasp all the difficulties associated with that war. So uh, Mud, Blood and, Mud, Blood and Poppycock is a um, fabulous title. And as I said, when I saw Corrigan's name here, I thought I just have to have it. And gosh, what a brilliant investment this has been. Rollicking uh, read. Um, takes us really from the foundation of the Hundred Years' War, way, way, way before the time of Edward III himself, back to uh, William the Conqueror and Harold Godwinson and those figures in the Norman invasion of Britain. And really it shows the uh, territorial patchwork, the claims made by various different figures, way before the nation states of either England or France were properly um, cohesed. These were lands and domains in ruling family hands. And through intermarriages and deaths and lack of heirs, um, really the, the claims over these uh, lands and inheritances became uh, quite a vicious um, affair. And what was the basis uh, for lots and lots of wars so we get a wonderful lead-in uh, from uh, English history, um, the relationship with Wales and the Scots. The Scots feature and the relationship between England and Scotland features very largely in the early part of the book, all the way through to the relationship with various different parts of France, 
and how the English kings themselves, um, through their own um, uh, inheritances, plus through um, marriages, had acquired title to various different parts of what we now call uh, France. And as a military historian with a real background in uh, military, um, Corrigan is really great at discussing the truth of logistics in the period. And he, he does so in a very methodical, matter-of-fact way. He looks at uh, you know what it was like to actually keep an army uh, not only in battle, but of course waiting to go into battle, waiting to be put onto ships to be transported. How an army moved through the countryside, how you would set up a camp to accommodate thousands and thousands of men and a few uh, women that were um, 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 hangers-on, uh, but also horses. How did you corral horses? How did you feed horses? So the reality of the logistics, um, we get a really good look um, from Corrigan. We're going to uh, read uh, two little passages for you from uh, Corrigan's view on the importance and the actuality of logistics. It is sad, but perhaps inevitable, that interest in military history is centred on the battles and those who fought them, and that most soldiers would rather be out killing people than in barracks counting blankets. But the fact is that you can have the best soldiers in the world, superbly trained, highly motivated, brilliantly led and equipped with the best we weapons that money can buy, but if you cannot feed them, house them, resupply them, move them, and tend them when they are sick or wounded, then you can do nothing. Administering an army is far more difficult than commanding it in battle. The real heroes of most of England and Britain's successful wars are the logisticians, and they get precious little recognition for it. For the Siege of Calais, government agents went out all over southern England to purchase foodstuffs and other supplies for the army. They had to be found, collected, paid for, moved to the ports, loaded on ships, which themselves had to be impressed, and delivered to the army. While the army would attempt to live off the land in enemy territory, and by purchase in the country of an ally, the men would have to be fed while they waited to embark, while they were at sea, and on landing until other arrangements could be made. Royal commissaries would purchase the necessary rations in bulk and have them delivered to the muster stations or ports of embarkation, or this might be delegated to the admiral in command of a fleet. Meat would usually be salted beef, pork, bacon and mutton, although beef on the hoof could also be bought and transported, while vegetables would be peas, beans and oats. Wheat would be bought but ground into flour before delivery. Cheese was bought by the whey, a whey being 26 stones, and large quantities of dried fish, mainly herring, were also supplied. The potato was, of course, unknown, and its equivalent was bread, which was the staple for the medieval man who did not, unless he was very rich, eat from a plate, but from a trencher, a flat, boat-shaped piece of bread as wheat, which produced white flour, would only grow in ground that was well manured, white bread was restricted to the rich, while the lower ranks made to do with black bread made from rye, or loaves made from barley, or even from ground peas. Water was generally contaminated, unclean, and the bearer of all sorts of diseases, and so was only drunk in extremis. Instead, people drank ale, which was brewed from barley. The barley was soaked until it germinated and produced malt, which was dried and ground and then mixed with hot water and allowed to ferment. The result was only very mildly alcoholic, certainly not of the strength to have any effect, and the ration for a soldier or a sailor was one gallon per man per day. Many households brewed their own ale, and although brewing was one of the few commercial activities open to women, there were very few brewers who could supply the quantities needed by an army or a fleet. And of course, um, what we hear from Corrigan is what it was actually like to live through a siege, um, particularly in the camp of the besieger. During the latter part of summer and autumn, life within the English camp was reasonably comfortable. 
But with the onset of winter, conditions began to deteriorate. An army on the move could keep reasonably healthy, but once it became static, disease inevitably followed. Edward's army of 1346 was no exception. Little attention was paid to the cleanliness of water sources, latrine arrangements were primitive, flies and rats abounded, and soon dysentery, the bloody flux, began to take its toll. Dysentery is an infection of the gut and is passed on by contact with an infected person or by touching or eating something that has been handled by an infected person. Symptoms include watery diarrhea, often with blood and feces, nausea and vomiting, stomach pains and fever. While medieval man was probably more resistant to it than we are today, it could still be fatal. And even if it were not, a man's ability to do his duty was severely affected. Many of the spearmen and archers could have been infested with worms and colds and influenza would have been common. Malaria was then endemic throughout Europe, but was much more of a summer affliction, there being a lot fewer mosquitoes around in the winter. On top of the health hazards, manning siege lines was boring and gave few opportunities for acquiring glory or loot. Hence, there was a steady trickle of desertion by archers and spearmen, while many of the knights found excuses to return to England to sort out a land dispute or see to a son's marriage. There was also a problem with the horses, which started to die off from the cold, or so the chronicles tell us. But as horses grow a substantial winter coat and are very capable of surviving all but the most severe weather, it may have been an epidemic of strangles or perhaps starvation. Hay would have been running out and barley and rye intended for the horses may have been eaten by the men. The strangles that he refers to is um, a horse uh, disease, a disease um, of the, the gut. So there's some great examples uh, from the book and just about every page is packed with one on simply the reality of life uh, in an army and administering an army, uh, supplying them and moving them. Uh, a logistician, a history of logistics, Corrigan certainly is, and much in here for the armchair historian and the armchair general to learn from. Another thing, of course, that uh, Corrigan is strong in is uh, strategy and tactics. And he's particularly good at um, looking how the armies, again, really functioned, how their weaponry systems really worked, and what the actual tactics uh, of them were in reality, as opposed to how they've sometimes been depicted in uh, cinema, uh, where, as Corrigan points out, if uh, battle lines were drawn up in the way sometimes cinematographers would have it, uh, then the armies themselves would slaughter themselves. Um, if you get that logic. So let's look at a couple of little passages on strategy and tactics and weaponry. Technology came in the shape of the longbow. Bows and arrows are as old as prehistoric man. Simple, simple missile weapons, they are depicted in Paleolithic and Neolithic cave paintings and archaeological excavations have uncovered bows and arrows dating back to the third millennium BC. Bows were in use by Roman auxiliaries, and light hunting bows were used by both sides at Hastings in 1066. Quite how and where the short bow, drawn back to the chest and with its limited range and penetrating power, mutated into the English longbow is uncertain. It would not have been a sudden change, and the longbow may have been first used by the southern Welsh in the second half of the 12th century, although the evidence is scanty. It was anyway gradually and eventually enthusiastically adopted by the English and, as a reluctance to spend money on the fence is not confined to 21st century British governments, its cheapness would have appealed. The longbow would become the English weapon of mass destruction. It was consistently ignored by England's enemies who would consistently be slaughtered by it. From the time of Edward I's assize of arms in 1285, all free men were required to keep weapons at home and to practice archery regularly at the village butts, for the longbow was not something that could be picked up and used by anyone. Rather, like Scottish pipers, archers began to develop their skills as children, 
gradually increasing the size and pull of their bows as they grew up. Exhumed bodies of medieval archers show greatly developed or overdeveloped shoulder and back muscles. We tend to uh, think of terrorism as a relatively modern concept, one that sprang out of the 20th century. But of course, terror as a tactic has been, well, there since the beginning of time. And terror and terrorism and terrorizing a population was a central strategy, certainly of the English, in the Hundred Years' War. Let's hear from Corrigan as he tells us about the strategy of the chevauché. Edward was intending to embark upon a chevauché, literally a mounted raid, which involved moving rapidly through enemy territory, doing as much damage as possible, but avoiding pitched battle. The purpose was partly economic and partly to terrorise. The destruction of property, the levelling of buildings, the reduction of fortifications, the burning of crops, the removal of gold and silver, and the killing of people all damaged the economy by reducing the amount of tax that could be levied, while at the same time enriching the invading army. Terry, terror could persuade the population to change its allegiance and spelled out a message to the enemy ruler. Come to terms, or this goes on and will be repeated. Particularly relevant to at this period in history was the damage to Philip's honour and reputation if he could be shown to be incapable of defending his subjects. Leaders of such raids, raids usually aim to start from a secure base and slash and burn their way to another secure area or to a port where they could re-embark before an avenging army caught up with them. Edward would have been intending to sweep up from Normandy to the English county of Ponthieu at the mount, mouth of the River Somme, and then, depending on the French reaction, either to return to England or move into friendly Fra Flanders. At the time, there was little distinction between enemy soldiers and enemy civilians. Indeed, the line between them was blurred when most males had a military obligation. And although there was still a vestige of chivalry present, chivalry present in the relations between the nobility of either side, this was rarely extended to their inferiors. The peasants were always the victims in these raids, and nobody, whether English or French, cared very much about them. So the course of this book, um, full of political intrigue, full of character, and full of accounts of bloody, awful pillage and destruction. Um, in the uh, scenes, particularly around uh, Edward III's campaign uh, in France, uh, that eventually led to the capture, the siege and capture of Calais, what you see is this massive, very well organized, very professional mob. And it was a mob of soldiers raiding, looting, rampaging, pillaging, cutting a brutal sway throughout the French countryside. And again and again, in paragraph after paragraph, one after the other, um, Corrigan uh, outlined some of the most brutal uh, stuff, stuff that we would only think about as, as happening today, maybe in, you know, parts of, uh, of Africa or, or the Middle East, you know, real horror stuff. But as Corrigan uh, points out, that in many cases, this was sort of the everyday lot of people in that time of warfare in Europe. Now, what Corrigan is um, also uh, very strong on is history, the, the sort of writing and the regard to history uh, itself. And he has, has some interesting little passages that are uh, worth uh, quoting on historical revisionism, uh, but also on our ability to um, really uh, find things like the actual site of some of these old battlefields from the past and why they are so difficult to locate. Let's read a couple more passages from Corrigan. 
Historical revisionism is not confined to the wars of the 20th century, and Edward I has come in for a great deal of it from some modern writers. Most of the criticism of Edward relates to his time as the heir, and contemporary chronicles are less strident when writing about his reign as king, but then denigrating a prince is one thing, opposing an anointed king is another. The probable truth is that Edward was no more self-seeking and avaricious than any other great lord of the time, and less than many. In the West of the early 21st century, we like to think that personal integrity and unselfishness are vital in the conduct of our daily lives, and most of us would put, or at least try to put, country and the common good before self. But this is not the norm in today's third world, and it was not the norm in the medieval world. Then, it would have seemed very odd indeed not to put the interests of one owns family before all else. We should beware of judging the past by the standards of the present. How wise. So, on the subject of uh, battlefields and the difficulty in locating some of them uh, from that medieval period. There has, though, been some debate among historians over the exact location of the battlefield of Cressy. On the assumption that everyone knew where a battle took place, the chroniclers tended not to give more than a cursory description of the location. They were more concerned with embellishing tales of knightly chivalry. And archaeological evidence is either not there or impossible to find. Only when firearms appear on the battlefield can archaeology, by finding a line of musket balls where a line of musket balls has landed, and therefore from when they were fired, work out fairly accurately what happened. Metal detector enthusiasts are often surprised that arrowheads, broken swords, spurs, discarded helmets and the like are rarely found on a medieval battlefield. But all these were valuable items, even if broken. And if the field was not thoroughly gleaned by the victors, it was by the local inhabitants, so that in a very short space of time, no artefacts would be left. So this is definitely a most quotable book. I could quote for hours and hours and hours. Simply go and buy it and read it. And not only for the wealth of information, the illuminating history for a period that maybe confuses a lot of us. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a fairly well-read chap and, of course, um, from an early age learnt about the kings and queens of England. But sometimes I do scratch my head and try to remember which Henry and which Edward and which... This tells the story beautifully, wonderful uh, line. Again, right from the beginning, from the Norman conquests, uh, right to the death of Henry V, the descent of England into infighting and squabbling and civil war, and frankly a loss of interest in grasping that um, throne of France. And from the rise of Joan the Ark, of course, it shows how the French nation itself sprung up and how the national history, the national collective identity of France started to form, uh, even though, as the book points out, well into the 18th century, right up to the French Revolution. Uh, there were many, many parts of France that were very suspicious of Paris and wouldn't regard themselves as Frenchmen, more as Bretons and Aquitanians and uh, people from Flanders. So. Great story. But look, I think the key also in this book, like all great history books, is the writer. And Corrigan can write. He draws us in. He makes it a, a hard book to put down. He is a beautiful uh, pen portrait writer. 
he uh, is beautiful at describing character and in a couple of lines either demolishing somebody embellishing somebody um, showing all the flaws the weaknesses the greatness in their character and uh, exposing some of the little vignettes and uh, nasty little side of uh, stories uh, in the personal rivalries between some of the big bad characters in here folk who are all stabbing each other in the back in the front in the sides all for the pursuit of glory and power and wealth uh, let's finish off the review with a couple of nice little pen portraits uh, first of all one of them quite dismissive and uh, the other of Henry V uh, quite telling then in August 1350 just as France was recovering from the Black Death Philip VI died to be succeeded by his 31-year-old son, Jean II. Jean is known in French history as Jean Le Bon, Jean the Good, the mythmakers having taken note of his undoubted personal courage and love of tournaments, while quietly ignoring that he was vicious, irrational, unjust, militarily incompetent and stupid, which in the, which in the pantheon of French royalty means that he was very stupid indeed. He is described as being handsome and with a fine red beard, although in his portrait in the Louvre it looks more like designer stubble that has got out of control. He too founded an order of chivalry, the Chevalier des Eltois, whose members had to swear an oath never to leave a battle alive, which largely explains why the order no longer exists. And in contrast with that um, fairly dismissive uh, portrait of Jean the Second, Jean the Good, um, we get Corrigan describing one of the great figures of uh, English history, and certainly one of the great figures of literature, Henry the King at twenty-five, slaughterer of the French nobility at twenty-seven. Regent and acknowledged heir to the throne of France at 32 and dead at 34. If Henry V had lived, the history of England might have been very different. There cannot be many Englishmen, even today, who do not feel a frisson of pride when they think of Henry V. He shaped English history and what he did and who he was affects Anglo-French relations to this day. He was a king who deliberately fostered a feeling of Englishness, the first to write his letters in English and to prefer confer conversing in that language rather than in Norman French, a natural and charismatic leader who, if he did not invent English nationalism, certainly encouraged it and along with it a pride in nation and in race. While he was a master of propaganda and knew how to use the tricks of oratory, his repeated declaration that his chief concern was for the well-being and good governance of his realm and its people were genuinely meant. Of course, despite his oft-noted piety, he was not always a paragon of Christian virtue. He could be cruel and inflexible, ruthless, brutal, devious, short-tempered, frequently unreasonable, and always convinced that he was under the personal protection of God. But nice men do not win wars, and withal, Henry V must rank as one of our great kings, if not our greatest. Stirring stuff. And um, look, I must say that um, alongside uh, this book uh, and reading it really brought back to me the brilliance of the uh, play by Shakespeare, of course, Henry V. And one of my favorite, favorite, favorite uh, adaptations of it or presentations of it and probably in my top five or top ten movies of all time is Kenneth Branagh's Henry V and Branagh is just fabulous. A wonderful cast of characters. If you haven't seen the film, do check it out. We'll be providing some links to some of the classic scenes uh, below. Um, but it is a tour de force uh, by Branagh and his crew. And I don't think it'll ever be, it'll ever be uh, uh, bettered as a depiction of medieval kingship, medieval intrigue and medieval battle.
really good movie to complement this wonderful book by Gordon Corrigan. We only ever feature on this channel books that we love or books that we think are interesting and of course books that bring wisdom and this uh, from a, a perspective of military history certainly brings wisdom because Corrigan's mission is to tell us what it was really like and again as I've said before what it was really like for the ordinary people what it was really like logistically tactically uh, strategically and what it was like to be a lord a statesman a warrior a soldier in those times really really illuminating do check out some of uh, Corrigan's other books uh, in a future episode um, we're hoping to do a little piece on some good perspectives on World War One and when we make that uh, Corrigan's mod blog and poppycock um, will be certainly featured high on the list there and I understand that uh, Major Corrigan uh, apart from uh, being a writer is also um, um, a tour guide a tour guide uh, for uh, military history tours of Europe uh, so something I'd love to do uh, someday because if he is as good a guide as he is an author you'd be in for a real wonderful time if you like the books that we feature here on Reading for Wisdom, do please give us a like, subscribe, follow our links uh, uh, to some of our other videos, uh, come and visit our website, and uh, look out for some future initiatives uh, that we'll be announcing very soon. Thank you. See you next time.